Looks like a beautiful day on that side. It is absolutely perfect. Cloudless, no wind. Doesn't get better than this. A little, so, little bird told me you were up to something quite interesting this morning. Yeah, we were out on the water. Crayfish season is open, so just about everybody in town is out on the beach, lighting fires, having the crayfish right there with a cold Sauvignon, getting back into the water, taking more out. <laughs> What's your quota you allowed to take out, Johan? Allowed to take out four per person. Okay. Four per person, yeah. So. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's perfect timing. You're only allowed to do it like, I think like eight days and it's mostly over weekends, eight days in the year, which they announce in advance. So if it's a rainy day or the sea is upset or not suited to going out, you basically miss it. So yeah, today was just perfect. Perfect, so you make the most of it. Yeah, so we're joined again by Penny Cook and Terry and Tony, Joe. Um, Bronwyn is joining us again. Lydia, good afternoon. Happy to see everyone back. We are doing three wines again today. Um, Weather-wise, this side, I'm happy that we have a, a sparkling wine included, but we've got a few reds as well, Barry, for that side. If it's a I, I was just thinking with that weather in the background, it should be three whites, but on this side, we're definitely going to enjoy the reds, make no mistake. Yeah, no, we thought of you guys, so that's why it's the majority of them are, are reds, but you know, it wouldn't be festive pack or mix if there's no um, sparkling wine in there. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, so we've got one or two more signing up. Hi, Annie, can you hear us? Hi, yes, I can. All right, we'll get going soon. Perfect, it's getting the fire going, so no problem. How are you, Annie? That looks beautiful. I'm excited yeah. to hear what you're doing today. Yeah, so it's kind of sticking to the Christmas theme, so hopefully it's all going to come out right. <laughs> uh, uh, we have complete faith in you, Annie. I have no doubt. Annie's out of the kitchen. Sam, I'm sure she's had a, had a busy day in the restaurant already behind her, Johan. Yeah. But she looks a bit more relaxed outside. I'm sure she's got a glass of wine now that she's off duty as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think let's, let's get going. I think everyone knows the, the drill by now. Um, I'm Johan, I'm the winemaker at Pinguela Cove, and I'm joined by two of my colleagues. Uh, one is, is Chef Annie that you see on the screen, um, that's uh, agreed to pair a Christmas recipe with one of the wines. And then Barry, which is closer to home for you guys watching, uh, in Sussex in the UK, the sister property of Benguela Cove, which is also a, a wine estate called um, Leonard's Lee, um, that where Barry is, is based. Barry is our vineyard manager, our general manager over there. And as I mentioned, Annie is our, is our head chef. So we'll be going through three of these wines today. Um, you can ask questions at any stage. There's a chat section, there's a Q&A section. If you've got um, questions, maybe keep them in the Q&A. It's easier for us to pick them up there. But otherwise, as always, you have me. I'm happy for you to have a chat on the side. Hetty van, van der Beil Park has joined us again. Nice to see you back, Hetty. Um, yeah, so we get going. I mean, maybe let's... Um, start with Annie, and you look quite busy, so we can, if we start with you, then you can carry on with your stuff while we working our way through the wines. Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. So like we said, it's a bit of a Christmas theme, or our second Christmas theme webinar this week. So we're going to be preparing like a nice whole roast of beef on the braai. Like we said, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. There's no way we're not going to have a braai outside. Um, just to kind of make everybody a little bit jealous, Barry, sorry. Um, 
So we got a couple of sides we're gonna do with it as well. It's gonna pair with the petty as well. So we got some olive stuffed mushrooms. We got a couple of other sides we're gonna do as well. But like I said, it's gonna be a nice roast beef. So you can actually prepare anything with it. It's a piece of meat that literally gives itself to any flavors. So to start off with, we're just gonna use some nice olive oil. And as always, remember when you do a nice big cut of meat, take it out of the oven, or out of the oven, out of the fridge, <laughs> about an hour or two beforehand, depending on the size of your beef or meat, anything. It's just so it kind of gets to room temperature. So when you're cooking it, you do not want, the outside of the meat's gonna get kind of burnt and the inside is still gonna be ice, ice, ice cold. So it's not really what you want. It's just to regulate all that temperatures and stuff. So a bit of olive oil. We got a little bit of whole grain mustard over here. But they're just gonna wrap around it as well. Just not too much. You just want like this, just a bit of flavoring. It's just to add that little bit of extra taste to your little piece of beef, just on the meat side. Cause we're gonna put it on some medium coals. Cause you don't want it to burn. So it's quite a thick slice of meat. You want it to go nice and slow and then crispen up afterwards on some high heat. We've got a little bit of chopped thyme over here as well. A little bit of chopped rosemary. So we're just gonna season all the way around. And then the best part or the most crucial part is seasoning. You really, really wanna, don't be shy. Just season it all over nicely. And then we've got some nice mold and salt. Let's get that nicely pressed in there. And then again, all the way around, you've got four sides of your, do your beef, you wanna season all four sides. You wanna keep your skin or your fat side and just get a nice bit of salt on there because that is also just gonna help it crispen up afterwards. And like I said, nice medium coals and we're just gonna pop that straight on there. And it is right. fat like this, but I said it's medium cold, so it's not going to crispen it up hectically. I'm just going to season it nicely and then just keep turning it and turning it for what it's going to take. That is going to take about 40 minutes very, very slowly. And then we'll get some nice hot, nice hot coals on there afterwards just to crispen it up and get some nice color on it. And then we're going to let it rest for about 10 minutes. But while we're getting that going, Barry, you want to tell us a little bit more about the wine? Yeah, sure. I mean, I've got a few questions. I've never made it in that way by doing like that rub that you put on, but how do you know that you're not overcooking it? Because 40 minutes is quite a long time. Do you check it every once in a while with a probe or something? A thermometer. Sorry, interrupted you a little bit. Uh, you can get a thermometer. For medium rare, you kind of want about 55 to 57 degrees inside. But yeah, it's just regulating your temperature, regulating your beef, keep turning it, just keeping an eye on it. And check, keep an eye on your coals as well. So it's not too hot or too cold and it just keeps going. Sandy, do you turn it every five to ten minutes? Is there a recipe or is it just a feeling? Yeah. Um, there's not really much of a recipe. You kind of go on feel, but you can always see or feel it. Like I said, if you have a thermometer, it's going to help a lot. And it's going to, yeah, you're going to kind of know what's all happening with a thermometer a lot more than, so a lot of people don't, so you can kind of feel that it's medium rare, anything like that, and you push it. And depending on your heat, you can kind of figure out where it is. Okay. Okay. And an open barbecue like that or a closed one, what is ideal? Well, like a closed one is going to take a lot quicker because it's, you're going to take all your heat in there. So the same thing as an oven. So it's going to work like an oven where there's, because it only gets heat from one side, it's going to take a little bit longer. This why it's about 40 minutes. Okay. So if it's a closed barbecue, it's probably going to take, like I said, it's an oven in about 10 minutes hmm. after you've sealed it off and then put it in there. All right, looking forward to see what's going to come out of that. Uh, <laughs> Good right. luck, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Barry, do you have your, your wines ready? I, I do. I, I have to confess, I've already popped my cuvee. Um, oh, yes. So I'm just going to pour a little glass. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was waiting, so... Um, yeah, we discussed last week, you know, just rinsing, giving the glass a little bit of a, a rinse before you you pour the bubbles just to preserve the, the bubbles um, in the glass. Um, but talking of preserving, you know, these are such handy um, little 
pieces of equipment this is just like a champagne stopper um, and it's so easy to use just to when you've opened the bottle just to close it um, again and you can just stick it back in the in the fridge because you do lose your your bubbles eventually when the bottle has been opened for an hour or two hours so um, yeah very affordable ones worthwhile investing in, in these um, yeah, what would that do to the shelf life? I mean, the fridge life of that uh, sparkling wine once you've opened it. It depends on on the amount of alleage in the bottle. But let's say when it's half, you can easily, if you only have like two glasses tonight, you can with the greatest ease keep it for another two days. If it's, okay. But every time you open it, obviously you you lose gas. But if you pour two glasses, you lock it down again. You can keep it another two days for sure you know so the, the whole uh tablespoon thing obviously does not work um, yes. but uh this you can be be assured uh, so we've tasted uh, last week the jordan v which is our flagship um sparkling wine uh, so you know that is it's, it's a very special bubbly and it, it sits on in, uh, in maturation for up to three years and so yeah maybe a little bit something more for a, a special occasion but if, if you're like me and you really love sparkling wine you know you're also looking for something that you can open on the normal tuesday evening or just um open it you know without having a special occasion you know so this is more of an, an everyday um uh, bubbly that we we've made um it's called cuvee 58 and i'll just um, tell you a little bit about it um, like we usually do so um, we've run through all of this but i see there is one or two first time viewers <coughs> excuse me we're um, based right at the bottom tip of the of the african continent is where benguela cove estate is and we're um, in this yellow section which is called uh, the walkaway um, so it all started um, for South Africa and South, the South African wine industry back in 1652. Uh, the first um, wines were made down in, in the Western Cape, being the, the, on the supply route from the Europeans that discovered the East. Uh, Cape Town was kind of the halfway stop. Um, so that was established as a, by the Dutch as a, as a as a stop to get fresh produce, um, vegetables and meat and all sorts of things. And obviously wine being important as well. So um, they started uh, planting vines a couple of years prior to 1652, but it was actually dated and written in a book um, that it, on the 2nd of Feb, 1652, the first wines were made in the Cape. And interestingly enough, Barry, it's the only country in the world that it's documented to the exact day and year when the first wines were, were, um, were made. So we're, we've been uh, uh, around for a little bit more than 350 years. So we've been making wine, obviously not as long as the likes of the Italians or the French, but we, we've been at it for much longer um, in comparison with the likes of Australia or Chile, Argentina, the US. So we're kind of an awkward spot in that we, we're too young to be part of the old world, which is the, like the European winemaking countries, but we're too old to be part of the, the new world, what we call it, the modern winemaking country. So we're kind of in a, in a spot right in the middle, but in, interestingly enough, stylistically, of African wines are also not all the way old world, nor is it all the way the sweet, modern, new world style of wine. So definitely in a, in a, in a unique pocket as far as, as our wine industry goes, but also stylistically the, the South African wines. Okay, a little bit closer to home, Benguela Cove, um, where we at, where I'm based and where Annie is, you can see Annie's views then in the background. Um, Benguela Cove is a 70 hectare property. First vines were planted about 18 years ago. These vineyards that you see on the image were the first ever vines to be planted on this spot. Um, so it was completely uncharted waters as far as viticulture goes. Um, no one really dared having a vineyard this close uh, to the ocean. 
was from a, a viticultural point of view, and Barry can speak to it much better than I do. Um, in the old days, people were seeking out unique spots, fertile soils, lots of water, you know, everything that's ideal to have a vineyard because that produced a lot of grapes. Um, when we started having more of a quality approach, you know, people were seeking out different spots, higher up in the mountains, higher altitudes or closer to the ocean, cooler climates, because they just keep uh, a more unique wine style, a higher quality wine. So if, if nature is a little bit against the vine and it, it struggles to grow, we call it the vines are slightly stressed, you get a higher quality grape and a higher quality wine. So vineyard actually doesn't want ideal growing conditions if you're in the quality game. All right. Um, we're based, uh, for those of you that have been here or for the locals on, on this, uh, in Hermanus, so we're just at the outskirts of a little town called Hermanus. Um, uh, but let's get to the, to the wine. So the, the first one, <clears throat> like the one we've had last week, is a Method Cup Classic. You'll see it there on the label. And whatever is labeled as Method Cup Classic, um, it refers to the, the process that was used to produce these wines. So it's exactly the same process as what they use in, in Champagne, which is the, the bottle fermented uh, way of producing it. There's obviously other ways, um, like the Charmat method, of, of which the most common one would be the, the Prosecco wines, which is on a much larger scale. It's not fermented in, in bottle. And then uh, also the, the short, totally shortcut way of just injecting CO2 gas um, into the bottle. But go and look for those that says method cup plus six. Obviously, each and every country calls it something different. Um, it's just referring to the bottle fermented process, uh, like Spain would call their cava, or outside of Champagne, they will call it cremant. But um, yeah, it's just a, a reference to the, to the process. I said it's the, the bottle fermented uh, way of doing it. So the actual second fermentation that's responsible for producing the, the bubbles we have in the glass um, happened inside the very bot same bottle that we pour it um, out of. We went into quite a bit of detail on this last week, so I'm not going to repeat all of that. Um, if you wondered, because uh, I get the question quite often on the label um, and the name of the wine, uh, the Cuvée 58, it's just a play on um, the most famous um, diamond cut there is. So obviously, there's various cuts for, for diamonds, but the, the most popular one around the world, the one most uh, commonly done is this one you see on the screen, which is the round cut. And the reason why this is the most popular one is it's just with all the facets in it, it's the one with the most reflection, the most shine and shimmer. So, um, and uh, the round cut diamond has got 58 facets or cuts to it. So from there also Cuvée 58, and if you look closely at the label, it's almost like having a top view of a diamond as well. So, you know, um, it's a big craft and highly skilled people that cut diamonds. They train up to four years before they can do it by themselves. So it's a very detailed process, lots of precision. And it just uh, reminded us of on the winemaking side of the production of sparkling wine. It's so much detail and precision and exactness that goes um, into the production of sparkling wine. Because it is a, it's a very detailed process having the second fermentation in the bottle. You want the gas and you want the pressure, but you also don't want too much. Otherwise, you have the glass exploding. You can't have too little gas because then it's all flat. You can't get the cork out. So there's a, and you, the actual second fermentation inside the bottle is quite a process to, to get that going and the timing is, is of the essence. But if you want more detail on that, um, we can talk about that on, a, on another day, but it, it comes down to the detail that goes into the winemaking is the same kind of detail that goes into cutting a diamond. And when you get it right, you get something that shines and shimmers and makes you happy and um, bring smiles to people's faces. That's the idea of, of this wine. And that wine certainly does bring a lot of smiles to our customers in the UK, Johan. That I can guarantee you. Yeah, it's an extremely popular wine. 
Um, it's it's a little bit um, lower price than the Jour de Vie, so you know it's a, that's why I said it's a it's something that you can have. It's not something you have to keep for special occasions. This is the wine you open any day of, of, of the week. And I think what has also helped with the success of this wine, Barry, is that it's um, it's the only one that I know of that it's made from Sauvignon Blanc. So it's not traditional, if you like. It's been a bit adventurous because we wanted something that was quite showy and aromatic and fruity. So we've used Sauvignon Blanc. So it's got this nice like a um, citrusy peach, uh, like yellow apple, lots of nougat type aromatics to it. And I, I, it's, it's just, it's not showy, but it's just pleasing and it caters for a big audience, you know. So the, the, the traditional um, champagne lover that's quite serious about um, what they drink will love this, but also the, the more entry level person that um, is not a, a connoisseur necessarily. Um, will also appreciate this. So it caters for such a big audience that it's always a, a safe one to have. You'll also see it's a it's a non-vintage. You can sometimes get the question on vintage versus non-vintage. So a vintage sparkling wine like Arjo de Vie is a it's as an ex expression of a specific vintage, but it's always within a call it a house style. So it'll always be have a big well a co. Uh, style to it, but it might vary from vintage to vintage because obviously the, the growing conditions, the climate, the weather is different from each, each and every year. While this, a non vintage sparkling wine, um, we can blend uh, different grape varietals or we can blend in different vintages. So the whole idea is to keep it consistent year on year on year to be exactly um, the same or this, the closest we can get. So a non vintage will always consistently be the same, while in non-vintage, it's acceptable to have slight variances um, between uh, vintages. I hope that explains it. Absolutely. And Johan, not everyone could use Sauvignon Blanc in making a sparkling wine. I think it's, you know, Benguela, where you guys are situated, and you've got those amazing acidities in your grapes, um, is why, obviously, this is such a successful wine for you guys. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There's a reason why um, Sauvignon Blanc isn't commonly used for this, um, but our growing conditions have just been a little bit, it is different. We've managed the vineyards different just to, to get rid of that very high acidity that Sauvignon can have, especially in our um, conditions. So we've done a, a, a process which is called um, malolactic fermentation, which is actually it's a bacterial um, fermentation which converts some, it's a little bit technical, some of the malic acid into lactic acid, which makes it softer on the acidity, but also gives it this nice richness and creaminess that you get um, on, on this wine. But as I mentioned, extremely versatile, lovely on its own, as you guys can, can see back home, but also as a, as a food wine, um, it, it stands up to the, the food. It's got enough aromatic and richness to, to handle it uh, with the meal as well. Okay, if there's any questions on this, let me see if I've missed any, any questions. I've just got that question on the glass again, Johan. You've got the normal champagne flute and you drinking out of something slightly different. Yes, yeah, uh, thanks for asking that. Um, so you, I'm not sure if you can see my glass. I just prefer to use a, a normal white wine glass, your normal Sauvignon or Riesling um, glass. You know, the fluids are great. I actually have one here. These fluids are, are great. You know, they, they tell, they feel great. They look great. People that walk past can see you having bubbly you nose. Know, it's part of, of, of sparkling wine are these fluids. But when it comes to the wine appreciation and um, actually um, getting to smell it and taste it and appreciate it properly, these are, are much better. The simple reason is if you see how small the opening is on this and you've got the CO2 gas, it, it's very condensed. And when you try to smell it, it's almost like it suffocates you a little bit, you know? You get the CO2 gas and not you don't get behind the aromas that's coming out of the wine, where these with the bigger opening allows the aromas to come out and for you to, to smell and properly taste it um, much better. So 
most of the time people will serve you in these because that's what people expect to be served in but as i said if you want to get behind the wine and fully appreciate that these are, are the better ones i've actually got rid of all of mine back home of these <laughs> all right shall we move along and we can move on to the reds exciting yes i think we're tasting what's important here is we're tasting the two, the first time in the uk the 2018 collage yeah? all right We've uh, well, yeah, right. just sent us a shipment which arrived a few weeks back. Uh, we're still selling the 2015 vintage, but we've got the last few cases, which I believe will be gone by the end of the week. And then we'll move across to the 18. But okay. uh, our viewers that bought the Christmas box, they're uh, the first ones to open that bottle. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy what you taste this evening. Yeah, you know, that 15 is, is drinking um, so well at the moment. And I think it just shows the, the age worthiness of the Benguela Cove wines. You can, um, without a doubt, keep a few aside if you like slightly more matured wines. The 18, obviously, um, the younger vintages are fine. You don't have to sell them. We release them when they're drinking well. So we keep them back in the cellar. We keep them in bottle until we're happy that, they, that they're drinking well, and then we release them. But um, interesting wines, like any other wines, to track with time. So while this 18 shows lots of primary fruit flavors, um, if you look at the 15 now, it moves more towards the, the spicy, cedary side um, of things. Uh, but let's just quickly go into, into the collage and blends in, in general. There's this um, misunderstanding on people tend to think that blends are all the little bits and pieces that we've got left in the winery and that we just throw that together and, and there you go, that's that's a blend and it should be the cheaper wines. Um, I guess some of that is true, but it's um, if you look at most wineries, I would almost say 90% of, of wineries, their flagship wine, their top offering would be a blend. You know? So the winemakers put a lot of work and effort into blending. So it's, definitely not a matter of just throwing things together it needs to make sense why you blend in different grape varietals and different wines together the the, the main reason or the driver between um, behind blending is to create something better you know so it's like building blocks that you put on top of each other as you can see on the screen that the whole should be greater than the sum of the parts. What you blend together, the end result should be something better than the individual components. So it's a bit like a, a music band or music instruments. Um, it's fine on their own cabinet on its own or Merlot on its own and Petit without. It's great if you want to appreciate like pure cabinet. But once you start using them together, or have the musical instruments start playing together, the end result hopefully is better than the than the individual uh, part. So that's the reason behind blending. So blends are done all over the world. The main ones um, would be uh, those coming from France, which is the Bordeaux blends from the Rhone Valley. Uh, um, in France, in the Chateauneuf, the Pops, in the Southern Rhone, uh, there's Barolos, there's Chiantis, there's Super Tuscans, Barry Altmia. They're all, all of them are, are blends. Um, they like the Chiantis and then won't necessarily say that the name of, of the grape varietals in there, um, but they, they're just labeled as like Chianti or Chateauneuf, the Pop. Um, for centuries, but they're all blends if you if you ever wondered about those wines. So different wineries, different winemakers have different philosophies. So a lot of blends are one grape varietal dominant. So it might be 80% of Merlot or 70% Cabernet. And then it's just little bits and pieces. We call them salt and pepper just to, to fill that grape varietal in. Um, so one grape is the champion and the others are just complementing that. So they're in much lower percentages. Um, so this would be typically like this picture on here. It's a whole band in the back, but one instrument, one guy is kind of the champion. Not something we necessarily 
believe in. So sorry for my friend uh, Andre. So we don't have any rock stars or superstars in in our blends. Our philosophy is a, is a little bit different in that it's not about one champion right? and then blending it with little bits and pieces of other. You'll see on the back of the label is the, is the exact blend. So it's a blend of five different grape varietals and it's capturing the best of all of those grape varietals and having them in harmony. So you shouldn't pick up a glass of collage and tell straight away this is Merlot dominant or Cabernet dominant or Malbec dominant because they're all interwoven and blended um, together, you know, so you, you've got a, a red blend in a Bordeaux-like style. We just refer to it as a Bordeaux-style blend um, for the simple reason because we're using grapes that originate from Bordeaux, but we're not trying to copy them in, in any shape or form. It's just using grapes that traditionally comes from there. So ours is more like, like you see on the image, it's everything plays an equal part in, in the blend. And the, the winemaker is the guy at the bottom right, just making sure that everything is in tune and works together well. Looking very sexy there, Johan. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, the, the grapes that we use in this blend is the ones that you've got on the screen there. Um, all of them, the different grapes, as everyone knows, it's got different aromas. Some are more fruity, some are more spicy. Some are more prominent um, up front when you put take the first sip. Some of them are more prominent on the finish. Some of them, the tannins are more on the side of your palate. Some are more in the middle. So the idea is, is to taste them all individually, identify how they're all different. This one's more spicy. This one is more fruity. This one is more this or that. And also palate-wise and finish of the wine what makes them all different and then to start to play and to build the puzzle on how are you gonna blend them together so that the end result captures all the the strengths of those individual components so you can see on this image this is the palate or the mouth feel uh, and where it sits when you taste it of the different grape varietals you can see how they are all different and uh, the trick here what the winemaker needs to do is to find the right, the right ratio of Cabernet, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, and Petit. Uh, and that's quite a process. It's not just something we arrive at work one morning and we do it and off we go. It, it takes weeks. It takes two, three weeks to finalize a blend because you're constantly working on it. You might blend two or three components, then you're blending some other ones with it, then you revisit it the next day. You felt, oh, this isn't really improving on, on what I've done. So then it's going back to the drawing board and playing with different percentages and, and ratios. So it's, it's a lengthy process and it's a, it's a detailed uh, process. And it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a form of art or putting your, your fingerprint um, on that because no two people will make the same blend from the same set uh, of wine. So it's, it's a very... Um, individual thing, uh, if you like. As I said, the idea is using those components so it's a, it's a solid um, wine at the end of the day, like you see on the right-hand side, you don't want any holes and gaps um, in there or edges sticking out. So um, you, can, you can also mess it up, Barry. It's not always given that it's gonna be, the end result is gonna be better. So as I said, if, if I hand you on uh, for Barry or any one of you, Michelle, any, I give all of us the same five wines that we've used in this blend. Not one of us will arrive at the at the same blend um, at the end of the day. So it's a it's a matter of stylistic um, preference. It's it's what you prefer. I might like mine a little bit more robust. You might like yours a little bit softer. What we're trying to do is to showcase um, what Benguela Cove is, is known for. The reds, um, as you guys know, has all got a, a level of elegance and finesse to them. Um, they've got bright fruit. They've got this beautiful silky tannins. So we try and showcase that um, as best as possible. And uh, given our, our climate where we're at, it's also wines that are slightly lower in alcohol it's got this nice vibrancy to them, as I said, a bit more classical or more elegant, a little bit softer. 
um, in style and um, it's just lately a style that's um, more and more globally people are turning to it. Um, I think people are tired of those high alcohol, rich, sweet, very oaky, we call them jammy um, wines. So uh, I think there is still a market for those, but uh, um, it's something that's that's phasing out. Is that are you seeing the same trend that side, Barry? Absolutely, on. I mean, every time we, uh, it's certainly a, as you said, it's a, a thread that runs strongly throughout Benguela's wines that they're elegant wines and they're not high in alcohol. People are not looking for those wines, um, you know, over wooded and so on. So you spot on there. Um, I think the days of those wines are gone, certainly in the UK. Oh. Yeah, we yeah just, a, just a quick one on that. I see, so you've included Cabernet Franc in the blend there, where in 2015 you didn't. Um, was there reason for that? Yeah, oh, well spotted. <laughs> yes, it's um, in, when we did the 15 um, blend, we did have Cabernet Franc um, on the table. We did have Cabernet Franc on the table and we, we did play around with it in the blend, but it was just, it didn't add anything to the wine. It didn't improve um, the wine at all, you know. So we weren't just included for the sake of, of having all five. It needs to play a role and it needs to add and contribute something to the blend. So typically Cabernet Sauvignon will give you the, what we call the, the structure or the backbone, you know, it's got all the, the tannin and it's, it's quite focused where the, the Malbec is more juicier, more fruity, it gives more um, volume on, on the palate. Petit Vidal contributes color, brings um, some tannin, it's got nice acidity, Petit Vidal. Merlot is kind of almost like the, the frame, you know, it's, it's the soft and silky and just almost polishes it um, through. And where the, the Cabernet Franc brings a nice perfumey um, lift to the, to the nose especially. Um, but in, in 14, as I said, and, and it happens, you know, like we might blend the 2020 sooner and then it, the Merlot might not add or the Cabernet. So it's, um, yeah. It's, it's vintage dependent, very much so. It depends what the vintage was like and what that did for that specific variety. Yep. That's it. So, I mean, this I've, I've already spoken to it, but it's, this is a, a younger vintage. So it's got nice mulberry, like boiled sweets and you get that nice perfuminess, almost like a little bit of, of white chocolate. But what I like about this wine is it enters the palate kind of, not shy, but it comes in linear and then it just opens up and then it closes back out and it's just got the seamless, fine, silky tannin and finish to it. So for me, it's almost, it's one of those wines where you can use power and elegance in the same sentence, you know, and that is that is kind of what our, our reds are, are like. It's also you, one just, of just a quick one, Johan, do you see a, I mean, every year are you obviously learning more and more and really getting to know your vineyards and your estate? Are you starting to get a little bit of a recipe or, or realizing what percentages you would eventually end up with? Or is there still quite a variance from vintage to vintage? Yeah, I mean, we um, yeah going into the next wine, it's, it's a very fitting question that you ask, is that we are learning more and more as we go along and we look at every single vineyard because, um, you know, all of these vineyards are on different soils or different clones. So we're working on every vineyard individually and seeing how can we improve year on year on that vintage. What have we done with this vineyard last year? Uh, last year, <laughs> let's try something else this year and try and improve. And by trying to improve, sometimes you go backwards, you know? So it's, it's a constant learning process, but um, you know better than, than me, you being so involved in the vineyards that we've got little control over mother nature. And so every season is, is different, but you, there is some things that you, some learnings that you can take that you can use year on year on year that, that does work with, with the wine. But you constantly, it's like you're in this dance with, with mother nature, you have to adapt uh, according to the dance and you're not in the lead of the dance, but um, yeah, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And then just lastly, I mean, you've certainly, 
I mean, just the quality of these wines shows us that the Bordeaux varieties are really doing well on your property. So that must be becoming quite a strong focus going forward. Yeah, and it, it's not um, it's not called it by design or anything. It's just or a choice that we've made. It's just a coincidence of nature that our climate and our temperature pattern during the ripening and the growing season of the grapes is so so close to what they have in in bordeaux and it's, it's as i said it's just a coincidence um if you take all the the climate data from all the grape growing regions in south africa and in the world and you lay them over each other we're almost following the bordeaux graph exactly what they are experiencing i mean if you see in the back of me the big body of, of water again that's what they have in bordeaux you know so it's almost like copy paste so it comes as a little surprise that these border ones uh, do really well um, down here at Minguelaco. Well, at first we didn't expect that, but now that we've went deeper in and started to study, but why is it working so well? Because it was against anyone's expectations. We figured out, oh, the climate, and there was just so much similarities. But it's still, you know, compared to a, a Bordeaux, it would be much more structured. Tannic, um, you know, you can't have a young Bordeaux like this where we, uh, I guess, and it's also part of our house, our house style is that level of, of elegance and drinkability and, and finesse. You know, this for a two year old wine, you can just see how polished those tannins are already. So that's something we're very, we pay a lot of attention to, to making them nice and polished. Nice. And just a last one, Johan. I know a little bit of an unfair question, but if you had to choose one of those five varieties, what would your favorite one be? Jeez, that is a difficult question. You know, it's like yeah. five, five, five of my kids are exactly. lined up nine. <laughs> <laughs> They're all so different. They behave differently in the cellar. You know, they've all got their their own personalities and their own challenges and, and struggles, uh, you know, and, and you love them for, for different reasons. Um, you know, we do a single varietal Malbec, which is beautiful. If, if you feel like Malbec, uh, we're going to taste the Petit now. I think the Cabernet, and the Cabernet is, is in the lead here. I think it's 38%. Cabernet just works beautifully um, on Benguela Cove, but to pick one favorite, um, that's, that's hard, yeah. It's a little bit jump. Maybe the blend, all of them together. <laughs> to be honest, you've answered the question. You love all those varieties and they all do well. As you said there, it's hard to choose out of your children who, who you prefer. <laughs> that just shows the passion you have for the grapes you're working with and the, and the estate you're on. Yeah, let's, um, but let's try the Petit Verdot, uh, which is, it's something you hardly ever see um, for those that are on the call. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen a Petit Verdot in, in the shops. Um, it's not a grape varietal that is commonly done on its own. Um, and this is in our, what you see on the screen in our venography range. So this is our small batch experimental wines. It's not something we repeat year on year on year. So in 2017, our only red in this um, range was a Petit Verdot. It doesn't mean that there's an 18 or a 19. Uh, who knows when we'll make a single varietal Petit Verdot um, again. So it's a, it's a fun, interesting, it's always changing the, um, the wines and it's kind of collectibles, if you like, with their very limited production. So the Petit was You'll see it got actually got the bottle number on there. It's 645 bottles. That's all there is um, for all our global markets. So, um, yeah, small production. And Barry, you just asked the question, and it's what uh, being a fairly young property, um, as I mentioned, uh, we need to work quite hard to not to play catch up, you know, but there's so much to learn and understand. You know, we've not been making wine here for a century. Um, so we, we're really focusing and experiment, experimenting quite hard to understand our soils, the climate, um, how they react, how the vineyards react and how we should uh, adapt to what we do in the cellar. You know, all those collective 
um, things together are called terroir, you know, to understand our terroir and how we should and what we should do in the cellar and how to connect all those those dots. Um, and this is kind of where these wines originate from, is because some of those experiments that we do, those that do turn out well, will go into into this um, into the vinography range. And obviously, all those learnings that we take, all the discoveries that we've made, um, will the next season use that on a larger scale across all the the wines that we make. So it's just constantly improving year on year on year. The quality is just on the up um, all the time. So some of the stuff we do is like cutting edge, um, latest, uh, be it products or techniques that's available in the world of, of winemaking. So a lot of the suppliers to the wine industry would come here and test out new products, different ways of doing it. We've got some students from the university um, joining us during harvest to do their research work. So um, a lot of new fun and innovative stuff is, is happening here at Pinguela Co. And those, as I said, that we are excited about will be bottled in these labels as a memory of, of what we've done. So vinography, vino, obviously meaning wine, and graphy is uh, making a, a note of a, in a technical journal or having a memory of what we've done. So instead of writing it all in a little book, we just put it in bottles so we can enjoy it as well. And share so you're actually forming a little library there of your of your experiences over the vintages, aren't you? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So um, we're keeping some back um, as well in the library just to track them over time and see how they how they develop and um, imp hopefully improve in bottles. So on the label, if you wondered what that is, that is a, a sextant is the name of the instrument. It's an old um, navigation instrument that they've used in, in sailing back in the days. Again, you know, us being so close to the ocean and with our lighthouse collection and the, the sea and having such a strong influence on our wine. Uh, again, there's a bit of a maritime uh, or a marine type uh, story here. As I said, these were used um, back before they had GPSs and all sorts of fancy um, implements. Uh, uh, equipment to to navigate the, the sailors use this instrument so it was always it had two sets of, of lenses so the one they uh, would set on the horizon and the second lens they would set on a star or the moon or what the sun or whatever was up at that time of day and then they could calculate um, where they were going by just using this uh, equipment they could navigate themselves uh, back then. So um, this is, again, it's just a play on this instrument and what we're doing, you know, we're constantly adjusting and setting our way and what we're doing and where we're heading with our wines and um, where, we, where we're off to. So, um, yeah, so therefore the, the instrument uh, on the label. Um, but I don't know if you, if you ever knew this, but we also, while looking this and reading up about this, um, you might have seen that a lot of the, the pirates always have one eye lid or clap on it. I don't know if you know the, the story why all the, the sailors and pirates always have one eye covered. I, I have no idea, but I do. <laughs> Let us tell us. <laughs> no, it's got absolutely nothing to do with this wine, but it's just interesting. I, mean, I read it is that, you know, Obviously, it was easy at night. You can adjust the top lens at a star or the moon. But what do you do during the day when there's there's nothing to set uh, the lens on? So they could only use the sun. And obviously, looking at the sun through a lens isn't a great idea. So eventually, with time, the, the one eye would be burned completely by navigating and using this instrument. So piece of useless information for you. <laughs> Okay, so this wine was, an, was a more of a, a vineyard experiment than a, a cellar experiment. So we've tried, we've taken one vineyard and we did a whole host of, of different uh, treatments uh, in the vineyard. Um, Petty Bordeaux is deceiving in that it, it looks, you can see from these leaves, it looks like it's, it's struggling, it's battling to stay alive and it looks all miserable and unhappy. So what, 
you go in and you want to help the vines by giving them more water or more fertilizer just so they can grow and be be happy and just look a little bit better because these vines look like they you know about to die on us um, but then what happens by giving it so much love and care is that it it grows so much and it, it might produces too much fruit and the berries are too big and um, with the bigger berries and the lots of bunches you get diluted flavors and tannins and you end up adding a wine with not a lot of depth and, and complexity so what we've done like we've done with all our vignettes um, when we started uh, the winery back in 2006 was to have a more of a, a precision approach to our farming you know we would go and for each and every single vineyard We'll do infrared photos just to make sure, you know, are they really struggling? Which patches within a vineyard block, even though it looks even, are, are, are growing better? Which are struggling? Where should we pay attention instead of just irrigating everything as if it's one vineyard block, uh, fertilizing it, and even worse, picking everything in one go? Because this green section is almost like a completely different vineyard from the, from the red section. So with the petty, we've had one section where we just ignored all the single, all the signals it was giving us. So we didn't um, give it any water, any fertilizer, anything. We just monitored it with a, what is an instrument that we're now using to um, measure the moisture in the plant. And even though it looks a little bit miserable, by measuring the moisture content in the plant, we could see, but it's actually not struggling. Um, and then we've had different approaches and different parcels. And the one parcel where we just turned a complete blind eye to the vineyard um, was what we have in the bottle now, which, um, as I said, that's what's a, it's a vineyard trial more than a, what we did in the winery. So, um, uh, so ever since we've been just poor pet, even though we've just been ignoring the vineyards and letting it really stress and call it struggle, if you like because that produces these really small berries. The smaller the berries, the more concentrated the flavor, because you've got much more skin, very great skin to juice ratio inside. So it's like, if you want, ever wanted an example of dynamite, it comes in small packets, Petit Vidot is one of those. So small berries, really concentrated, dense, lots of tannin, lots of flavor, lots of aromatics, and I think it just, shows in, in this wine um, how much of everything it's got without being over the, uh, the top still. Um, still keeping it within our, our style. So that is, um, that is the, the wines um, for, for today. Um, is it more red, Barry? We're moving into white wine season. The, the sun is out. We went cray fishing this morning and we've got, uh, there's no, Thing, there's nothing better with crayfish than an ice cold um, Sauvignon Blanc. But for those that are planning on visiting, um, this is what you can expect when you come to us. Uh, as I said, we've got the, it's summer this side. We're out on, on the boat. Um, the white wines are out. Um, we've got some beautiful views. We've got our visitors back at the property and everybody's in, in high spirits. Let's hope we can keep it that way. Um, but yeah, if you, second best thing, while we can't really travel, if you want uh, a piece of, of Benguela and a piece of South African sunshine, um, the second alternative is to pick it up in the form of a, a bottle of Benguela Cove wine to enjoy. Um, uh, and I hope that we can make it to everyone's Christmas tables this year as well, you know, if you, if, as I said, if you want a little bit of, of sunshine on your Christmas table, there's this mixed pack that we've been tasting through the, the last two weeks. So, and it's still available online from what I understand. So, um, it certainly is, Johanna. And again, yeah. just, yeah, thanks to you for an amazing, informative tasting. I'm sure all our viewers have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, those Christmas packs are certainly still available. Um, and thanks to all our all our viewers that have already supported us and have ordered those packs. Uh, I just thought today, just you know, it's tough finding Christmas gifts. All the shops are closed. You can obviously shop online, and uh, just a, just a couple of nice ideas to think about is possibly 
a wine club membership. Um, for those of you, a lot of our viewers actually are wine club members and we thank you for that. Um, as you know, you get 20% off, off our wine throughout the year. And every three months you get an amazing case of wine, which are wines which have been personally selected by Johan himself. We also have the, you also have the opportunity of tasting the first of the vintages that arrive on this side of the water. And we, we're really working hard on that wine club. I think what makes us quite unique is the fact that we have, we have the winery Benguela Cove, we have the vineyards here in the UK, um, and we're busy developing our new UK brand um, and hope obviously to open our winery in the next year or two. Um, and just being part of our wine club, you really become part of the big family. Um, and it's gonna be an amazing journey. So for those of you that haven't joined the wine club, I really recommend uh, you guys thinking about that. So Hello, it's the wine club. Sorry, Ivan. I think it's a great gift. I, I wouldn't mind getting a wine club um, sub subscription for, um, for Christmas. And you get first access to all of these uh, vinography wines as well. So there's a, there's a nice perk in there already. There you go. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's ultimately what we want. We want you to be part of this family get to know us all personally. Um, a lot of our wine club members have come to our first Pinotage harvest, which was great fun. Uh, you know, you will always be the first ones to be invited um, to these type of events. Then of course, we've got, got our gift vouchers, which we offer, which offer wine tastings here at Manning's or at Leonard's Lee. Uh, we can do wine and food, uh, teas pairings, sobrages, which are great fun. Uh, we've got a few tricks up our sleeve, which we plan to launch in the new year. We'll let you guys know about that. And then just a nice stocking filler, which I think is a great stocking filler, is this has just arrived on our shores and that's the Cuvée Magnum. So we're selling this for 35 pounds a bottle. And uh, I mean, what a perfect thing to open up on, on Christmas day. Uh, we also have two reds. We have the Syrah, which is over here. And we have a collage in the same same format. So we've got those three wines in Magnum come in a beautiful box and the perfect little gift, I think, for 2020. All right. I like those Magnums. They're fantastic. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can think of no better gift, to be honest, that I would like to receive. <laughs> I think you need one of those big Magnums, given the size of Annie's steak she was putting up on the, on the fire there. Annie, are you... I Still around. There we go. Ah. Oh, sorry. Let me take those all. <laughs> so, yeah. So, we're basically, basically, basically done over here. So, we've got a steak that's been resting just on the side over here. Nicely, nicely cooked. So, you, say, you can feel it. See, most of the time, you can use a thermometer, but that is to me, that is absolutely perfect. So, we're going to have our little board. We're just going to present that. We have. Have some aubergines on the side if we're going to put on as well. Now, you can roast them, you can put them in the oven, anything, and then especially with your mushrooms as well. They are absolutely amazing as it is with the olive cream cheese filling. But if you want to like put a little bit of extra effort in it, you can always hollow out that aubergine, mix that in with your cream cheese and your olive just to add a bit of a smoky, smoky feel to it. Okay, and then we got our bone marrow mashed potato as we have an extra bone marrow. It's going to put it on the side over there. And then that's it. Okay, we're just going to sit it up nice over here. So this is all paired with our petit vidot. And the reason for that is just the earthiness and the mushrooms and the olives is paired perfectly with that. And then especially the smokiness, well, it's not really smokiness of the fires as all that extra flavors and stuff into it. And then you have your sirloin, it's not a very big flavorful meat. So you can actually really just put anything with it. You just need that really leaks so to bring that herbaceousness out, the earthiness of it, that smooth silkiness that Johan talks about, just with that creaminess of the cream cheese, it works fantastic. So yeah, guys, let me garnish it quickly. And that's it. Hope you enjoy your Christmas and hope to see you soon. All right, looks fantastic. Wow, Johanna, you're gonna get a little bit of that later. I am gonna try some of that just now, Barry. Um, 
uh, as we wrap up this side, which I think it's it's about time. But I was thinking we spent so much time together this year. I think we've done like 16, 17 hours worth of wine tasting, which is a lot of fun. But I can't leave our, all our English supporters um, and member, wine club members and those that are tasting with us all along can't leave you guys without a little bit of an Afrikaans lesson as well. So I just want to say thank you for joining us for all of these. And in Afrikaans, to say thank you is by a donkey. So for you to pronounce that, all you need to say is by a donkey. And just there, you've said thank you very much in our mother tongue language, which is Afrikaans. So from my side, Barry, Annie, and everyone that joined us, it's been great fun. Hope to see you soon again. And bye, a donkey. From my side, Merry Christmas to you all if we don't see you before then. Thank you to you, Anne and Annie. All the bye, best. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.